The article just said falsely accused, and it described a young man, maybe 19, 20 years old, in a college uh, on the East Coast who was accused by a young woman, same age, of raping her at a party. The woman um, said that while they were at the party, two or three men took advantage of her, and she listed him among the culprits, and he was summarily excused from the school, dropped from his football team, and dropped from his uh, scholarship. The woman later came out and said uh, that she had not, in fact, been uh, molested by him, that she was accusing him simply to get the attention of another man in the school that she hoped would sympathize with her. But in the meantime, the young man had lost his scholarship, had lost his place in the school, lost his position on the team. And what did the school say to you, they said, when they approached you? He said, well, that's the problem. They never really approached me at all. They never asked whether it was true. They simply appeared one day and stripped me of my credentials and removed me from the school. And that was about a year ago, and I wish I could tell you that things had leveled off, that he had found a place, but to this day, he is still performing on the street, he said, near New York, because he is trying to um, get a career in music, still out of a school and a scholarship. Many times when I'm speaking to people who deal in prisons, I've spoken in prison on a few occasions, I'm warned when I go in, be careful, Steve, because everyone in the prison swears they're innocent. The trouble is that some of them actually are. Just last month in the city of Detroit, a man was released after 46 years in prison for a crime we now know he did not commit. Psalm 31 is a psalm for people who have been falsely accused. It is a popular psalm. It's used by Jonah, used by Jeremiah, used by Jesus. The most famous words in the psalm are in verse 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You know someone who said those words, don't you? So if you have time this week, if you want to enter the pathos of Psalm 31, just stop there. Before you move into Easter, pause and put yourself in the position of the one on the cross. Stripped of all of his credentials, impaled in front of his enemies while the real culprit, Barabbas, runs free. His closest friends are nowhere near the scene so much as we can tell, or if they are, he must be wondering, what are they thinking now? The religious leaders, the, um, the scholars, they're all wagging their finger and shaking their heads saying, see, I told you so. Even his mother can't bear to look at him. And so he says, uh, woman, look at your son. The first person to believe in you, the last to give up hope. Look at me. We speak often of Jesus' last words from the cross. That is the things that he said while he was being crucified. We don't speak much of what he didn't say. There, there are no words of threat. There are no words of um, innocence. He never says, I didn't do this. You read that wrong. He never says, in three days, <laughs> I'll be back. 
Yet he seems to be the only one in the scene who knows things are not as they appear. So you stay in that moment and just imagine what it is to be completely innocent and yet accused of something opposite your character and to stay there for a while. Psalm 31, like Psalm 27, speaks of enemies. Verse 4, verse 11, verse 15. But these enemies are not those who threaten with violence. These are those who slander with their tongue. It's what Job called the lash of the tongue, the accusation. So the psalmist says, they, uh, they lie, they, they conspire, they, they say things about me that aren't true. And he, he can't say, as we often do, well, I don't care what people think, because he does care what people think. He says, verse seven, my soul is in anguish. Verse nine, the grief is overtaking me. My bones are tired from the internal agony. I am like a city under siege. Verse 21, surrounded by people who are just saying things that they can't prove. Have you ever been in that situation? Yes? No? (laughs) You wait. This day that we live in right now is so charged with accusations. We are a hypersensitive, hypercritical society in which words are said not to defend ourselves, but to hurt somebody else. And by the time those words are proven to be false, it's like the fire has already burned. It's already done the damage and you can't get in front of it. You just live under the wrath of somebody else's false accusations, their malicious gossip never seems to catch them. I can think of four kinds of people uh, in the room to whom this psalm would apply. There are those who are being falsely accused. They're being slandered by people who want some advantage over them. Have you ever run for public office just to have your opponent slander your name in front of the community? What? So they can get elected. Sometimes they stretch the truth. Many times they just flat lie. And it seems like every time you defend yourself, you're losing ground. Have you ever been in a courtroom where the attorney from your opponent starts to cast uh, these dispersions about you and they don't even know you? Have you ever been a business that is losing the market to another business in the community because they are undermining the integrity of your business. Have you ever been on social media and seen your name mentioned? Second, I think the psalm is for people that suffer the prejudice of other people who are in power. Have you ever uh, been maligned just because you are of the wrong ethnicity or of the wrong gender? 
Have you felt like you had to be better than everybody else in the room just to be as good as everybody else in the room? Have you ever heard things said about you as if you were a certain kind? I've had people say to me about uh, 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 people in our community, well, well, you know, Pastor, that's the way they are. I said, wait. <laughs> Who's they? Well, you know who I'm talking about. No, I don't know who you're talking about. Who are you talking about? And, and the conversation. Have you ever been on the receiving end of that? Third, I think it's for people who are in positions of leadership. And you have to make decisions for an organization. And you can't always defend the reason you did what you did. Years ago, my dad said to me, Steve, the hardest thing you'll ever have to do as a leader is make a decision you cannot defend. People will say, why'd you do that? And if you tell them you've betrayed someone's confidence, you're just going to have to say, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to trust me, but they won't trust you. <laughs> and you will live under the scorn of somebody's scrutiny and criticism. In fact, you might just mark it down that if you've not been criticized as a leader at least one time in your life, it's probably not because you're right all the time. It's probably, with all due respect, because you're not doing anything. It is the role of leaders to disrupt the status quo. Not all the time, but that's what they do or their managers. <laughs> and so it is the role of society to resist that disruption. <laughs> if you never feel it, maybe there are risks you ought to take that you've already shied away from forth, I think it describes people in a highly secular culture who are trying to hold forth the gospel of truth. I am talking about business leaders that in, in uh, physicians who, who talk to me about living in or working in a culture that is overcharged with secularism. It's biased against religion as if somehow the more intelligent are the irreligious. And they face this bias every single day. I get letters. I got one about a year ago from a student that left our church to go on to a graduate program in the University of Minnesota. Bright kid, deep heart of faith. He's been gone a month and the letter says, Pastor Steve, Oh, I miss God's church. Oh, I miss my Christian university. I am now in a doctoral program for chemistry and I think I'm the only one. While the professor who has the privilege of leading the discussion ever just can say things. <laughs> I think it describes Christian universities who are trying to hold to their theological core and while they're doing it, they get charged by society for this or that. And it's not only not true, people, it's the opposite of what the university stands for. Are you, are you with me? In other words, what I'm saying is Psalm 31 appeals to probably 75% of the audience this morning, people that are trying to live the Christian life, and it is hard because society is slanted against it. When I thought of you, immediately a bunch of verses came flooding into my mind. Matthew chapter 5 says, uh, blessed are you when people persecute you and revile you and say all manner of evil against you for my name's sake, for so did they of the false prophets. Matthew 5, 45 says, love your enemies. 
Pray for those who persecute you. Then you will be like sons and daughters with a father who is in heaven. First Peter chapter two says, live such good lives among the people so that even though they accuse you of doing wrong, parentheses, they will. They will see your good works and they will glorify God on the day he visits us. First Peter chapter three, keep a clear conscience so that people who accuse you of doing wrong will be ashamed of their slander. Proverbs says, do not say, I will repay. No, no. Wait for the Lord. <laughs> and then he will repay. Proverbs says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Because if you do this, you'll not only heap coals of fire on his head, but your father in heaven will see it, and then he will reward you. Proverbs says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes sure even his enemies like him. Now, if you listen to these verses in slow motion, you'll notice that they're not only warning us against danger, they're also promising us of something real in the midst of danger. They're saying, even though you will be opposed and persecuted and falsely accused and slandered with malicious gossip, if you do this right, then... All of these things will happen. You will feel like sons and daughters. You will be happy. People will see your good works. They will be ashamed of their slander. The Lord will cause your enemies to be at peace with you. If, <laughs> if you deal wisely, with slander. Translate. Your ability to be a powerful witness in a dark age rises or falls on your capacity to deal with slander. Let me say it differently. If you lead an organization, if you lead anything larger than 30 people, your capacity to move your organization forward rises or falls on your ability to navigate slander. If you're waiting for someone who is accusing you to be proven wrong, if you're waiting to be vindicated of all the false charges, hear it, your vindication rests on your capacity to handle false criticism. If you start defending, you're losing. Peter says that uh, when Jesus was on the cross, it's like he meditated on that scene I just described. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, um, that he has left you an example that you should follow in his steps. Wait for it. Uh, there was no deceit in his mouth. impaled in front of his enemies, falsely accused. Do you know the stuff he had on them? To say nothing. No deceit was found in his mouth, but instead he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. That, it turns out, is the key. 
When we are falsely accused and people are just piling on the insults and truth is no longer a defense, every word out of your mouth just digs the hole deeper. The key is to entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. To entrust ourselves, listen, is not a one-time decision. It's a daily practice. We wake up in the morning in the heat of the conflict and we go through a ritual in which we entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. We put our appointments that day and the enemies in them in front of the Lord and we say, into your hands, I commit my spirit, verse five. My time, O oh Lord, is in your hands. That's a practice. That's not a decision you make in church today. You'll do it tomorrow morning at six or seven or 10, whenever you get up. <laughs> to entrust ourselves to him who judges justly um, it's not a way of responding. It's a way of being. It describes the kind of person we are so that when the insult comes, it is received by a different kind of soul. So it is to put ourselves in the place of someone who can be accused with integrity which leads us to the psalm. I'm not going to walk you through Psalm 31 verse by verse. There's 25, 26 verses. It's too many. I want to walk you through the structure of the psalm. There are four pieces to this, and these pieces become for me a way of walking myself through prayer when I face false accusations. The first piece is affirmation. He says, in you, Lord, I've taken refuge. You are my rock and my fortress. Into your hands I commit my spirit. I hate those who cling to worthless idols, but I trust in you because you saw my afflictions and you put my feet in a wide and spacious place. The prayer begins by just telling God things about him and things that he has done for you in the past. You're going to be tempted just to focus on the criticism. No, no, start in the past, in the ways when God has been faithful to you and articulate those things. And then quickly, the prayer moves to complaint. Be merciful to me, for I am in distress. My life is consumed by anguish. My strength fails. My bones grow weak. I'm the contempt of my neighbors. My friends cross the street when they see me coming. I hear people whispering about me and conspiring to ruin me. It's extremely important when we complain that we are uh, accurate and descriptive in the ways that we feel. Pause. It's essential that we do not at this stage accuse God wrongly. It is important that we stay in the place of how we feel and what the insult is doing to us. We cannot leave that space and start making judgmental accusations, but then move to petition. Tell God what you want him to do. Let your face shine on your servant. Let me not be put to shame. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let their lying lips be silent. Lead me and guide me and keep me from the trap and be merciful to me. In this stage when we're asking God for things, it's essential that we focus on ourselves, not on our enemies. Here's how I want you to take them down. No, no, it's better just to say, God, is there any anything in this that you're using to search me and to know me and I want to lay myself before you. Guide me and teach me. Truth comes sometimes through our enemies, 
But we lose it when we slip too quickly into praying against our enemies. And finally, resolve at the end of the prayer. Oh, how abundant are the good things you have in store for those who fear you. In the shelter of your presence, you hide us from conspiracies and lying tongues. Right when I said, I'm cut off. Oh, you heard my cry. So you start with affirmation. You move to complaint. Tell the Lord what you want him to do in you and for you. And then move to a time of resolve. You see, that's pretty simple. until you're the victim. Then I can tell you how the prayer goes. Lord, this is what they're saying. And this is how they're wrong. And this is what I want you to do to them. And that's where the language gets very graphic. I mean, if our minds were a movie, it'd be rated R for violence. And then the second half of our prayer, though unstated, generally is, now, Lord, I'm going to wait and see how you handle this. And you don't handle it right. I'll handle it myself. And... I will form conclusions about you that are not healthy. What we forget is that when we are being falsely accused, God has a mind of his own and he is forming conclusions about you. While you're forming them about him. So it is essential to stay in the present moment and to pray with hearts of integrity. You still there? Uh, this, God bless you. Uh, this last uh, couple months ago, um, I was, I'm reading through Old Testament stuff, you know. I, I love the Old Testament stories and I'm, I'm um, reading in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is up building the wall. God put a fire in his heart. He went back to Jerusalem. He got a posse of construction workers and he starts building the wall in Sanballat and Tobiah. Two names that shall live in infamy stay on the ground and start throwing slander and accusations against Nehemiah. And as I read that story again, I noticed that their accusations escalated, went from a misunderstanding. What are you doing there? To mockery. Ha, even if a fox walked on that wall, he'd tear it down. To conspiracy. I know what you're doing. You're trying to make yourself a king. I'm going to go tell the king that already is in power what you're trying to. Do you see what's happening? Nehemiah, he says nothing. He just stays on the wall. That's, thank you, Zen. That's a good time to say amen. There's a powerful verse in there when Sanballat says, come on down, we ought to have a conversation. Nehemiah says, <laughs> I'm doing a great thing and I cannot come down. Boy, put that on your wall. I am doing a great thing and I cannot come down. I made a series of notes to myself. I've asked for permission uh, to share them with you. And so that's what I'm going to do in the form of advice to people that find themselves falsely accused this morning. Rule number one, you will be criticized <laughs> or 
where you're not doing anything. If you shine like the light, you will expose deeds done in darkness, even if you're not trying to do it. It's in Ephesians chapter 5. If you live such good lives, you will disrupt the status quo. And people who have something to gain from things staying as they are will resist you. It's their job. So if you're doing something against the grain in an organization, in the culture in general, you will be resisted. Learn the courage to be disliked. You're still thinking, I can appease them. I can fix this. I can make this right. Watch my head. Number two. You, uh, you will face resistance, but number two, you do not need to answer your critics. You do not need to defend yourself. You don't need to explain all the time why you did something. As if information is going to change the culture. You must beware the pseudo-mission. Pretty soon, your mission will shift from the thing God has called you to do over to making people happy. You must not make that compromise. Your enemies do not need to intimidate you, and they don't need to stop you. They simply need to distract you. And you'll stop yourself. Third, you do not need to answer your critics, but you do need to finish your job. If you're Moses and they're grumbling in the wilderness, you must give up the dream of building consensus. You pass that exit. Your job now is to move people to the promised land. And if you can do it, they'll be talking about you later. If you just build a nice community, they'll forget you. If you're Paul, you must continue to teach the churches in the form of lectures and letters. If you do your job, those will become books in the Bible. You must not be distracted by the arguments in the synagogues. If you're Nehemiah, stay on the wall. You are doing a great thing and you cannot come down read a line this last month that went like this. Your circumstances are not the reason you can't succeed. They are the reality in which you must succeed. So succeed. Fourth, in the heat of conflict, Give God something noble to protect. Never trade favor for justice. You're bargaining down. If your fight for justice is making you angry or cynical or adversarial, 
then something is happening to your insides. And God cannot bless it. If you seek favor, you'll get justice. If you seek justice, you'll get neither. Make sure that your heart remains the kind of heart God can bless. Otherwise, he is stuck with an impossible choice of choosing between two forms of tyranny. The tyranny of evil and your tyranny of righteousness. But it's tyranny. And fifth... Leave room for God to judge.